French uh, colonial claims, namely that they said to the world, hey, these are a few Christians in a sea of Muslims. We're going to protect them, and we're needed there for that purpose. Very soon, uh, Zionism uh, made the same argument. So we have a Christian population in Lebanon, and there is a Jewish population in Palestine in a sea of Muslims, and we need the help of the West. Of course, these were exaggerations. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, nevertheless, they wreaked their havoc. So around the Mutasarrafiya of Beirut, Mutasarrafiya is, a, is a, an Ottoman term, it's something akin to um, counting or so. So uh, around the county of Beirut, they kind of drew an ar arbitrary line. They said, okay, this will be Lebanon. Um, within that line, the, the majority of the population were Muslims. That did not matter to them. Eventually, it yielded the confessional system in Lebanon, which is the reason why young people are out in the street saying, screw that, basically. Uh, we don't identify as Shiites, Sunnis, Muslim, Christian, this and that. We are Lebanese. And that became the basis for their calls for reform, among other things. So, those immigrants who came here, and in contravention of what you might hear in the discourse on Arab American studies, uh, so there are several layers to this introduction that will be challenging settled um, accounts of our history in this country. Let me, I think I'll glean over those, otherwise we'll be here for a while. Uh, so let me tell you from the get-go that this presentation flies in the face of and is beginning to change our conception of who we are in this country, what baggage do we bring with us, how do we identify. I can tell you definitively, based on research, that the immigrants who came here identify themselves as Arab, Syrian, and whatever else later. If it was important for them to be Orthodox Christian, Soviet, Sunni, Shi'i, whatever, but they were Arabs. Syrians, Arab Syrians, and they wanted Syria's independence. These are two major arguments that kind of fly in the face of very fragmented and nascent Arab American studies. Actually, I, I refer to Arab American studies as a 50-year-old infant. I, you know, um, to make a long story short, after 1967, uh, after 1965, in fact, immigration doors opened up. You have people seeking you know, college education. Many of those became politicized after 67 of all you know, um, national backgrounds. And they commenced Arab American studies. And so um, one way I could have introduced this whole talk is through observations I have in this very museum we're sitting in. Uh, right upstairs on the wall, it says that until 1967 and the Arab-Israeli war, there were no Arab American political organizations, it's still on the wall, uh, by the way. So this presentation basically challenges that, as though we should, as scholars, um, and builds on it at the same time. So we're building on the social research studies that were instigated by all kinds of you know, nationalized Arabs after 1967 to quantify our experience in this country. I'm not dismissive of it. But what I'll be sharing with you today is four major formal political organizations, whereas the most scholars would tell you is that those were primary group affiliations, like village and, and, and uh, clans with loose connections. Uh, but they, ha they lacked national identity. They were not self-aware. Nothing could be further from the truth, as you know. So, in fact, upstairs, some time ago, um, there was, I think it's still on display, a robe belonging to a guy named Khalil Totah. And right across from that robe, there was a picture of a, a merchant in a grocery store wearing like a, a white uh, uh, apron uh, named Amin Farah. And it said that this guy owned a grocery store and that guy is a graduate from Colombia. Between those two, there is 50 years of relentless, non-stop, formal political advocacy for Syria. And all the you know, um, events that kind of that advocacy yielded, like 
advocacy for Palestine proper, um, or for Lebanon, or for Syria proper. That history is what's missing completely from the discourse. And this is what we will be talking about very, very briefly. And please don't be annoyed if I glean over a lot of uh, um, dates and pictures here. So the very first example of this political mobilization is this, this unassuming um, pamphlet, actually, is the bylaws of the Free Syria Society, founded in 1915. And to the best of my knowledge, I think it was modeled after the bylaws of Al Arab Al Fatat. Al Fatat was an anti Ottoman society, very secret, very large, very effective, and to this day we don't even know its members. Uh, it may have been printed in Egypt or in the American presses here in the United States. I'm not sure. I need to do some forensic investigation. But that became the, the basically the principal. A uh, roadmap towards a, an independent Syrian state in all parts of Syria, Greater Syria, yeah? 1915, and among its members. And I didn't bring those uh, documents. I kind of protective of them. I keep. I actually couldn't even find them. That's how protective I am of them. But uh, you've heard of the name Mikhail Naimi. Some of you, some of you, is a close uh, friend of Gibran. One time, actually, a roommate of Gibran was a member of the society. So was Nasib Arida, and um, maybe tacitly uh, Gibran himself. Um, so it was founded in Flint, Michigan, about what, 170 miles from here um, to the north, by Amin Farah. And this is Amin Farah. I'm going to pass those around. You can look at them. Please do return them, eh? <laughs> this is one of the most the, rare, actually, documents I have. This is a conscription book belonging to Amin Farah when he was conscripted into the Ottoman army. You've heard of Safar Berlik? Mm -hmm. so Safar Berlik was actually forcible conscription for people to fight in the Balkans, and that's where they died, actually. I hear that my grandfather died that way. He was a young person, fought in the Balkans. Uh, when he arrived back in Nazareth, he died at the at his, uh, doorsteps. So. And that is Ottoman script, by the way. I have a few documents with Ottoman. You can read it probably, uh, Michael, but uh, it's like reading Pig Latin <laughs> to be a little bit uh, obnoxious to Turks, I guess. So this is uh, Arabic, uh, Ottoman uh, Turkish, written with Arabic alphabets, which is a dead language. I couldn't find anyone who can read it comfortably and translate it for me. So I had to read it as best as I can and have someone translate what it said. Uh, that's basically how effective this, you know, Europeanization has been in, in Turkey proper. So the Free Syria Society did what it can to kind of galvanize support around the cause of Syria itself. Um, in 1923, something very serious happened. So the Balfour, in 1917, in fact, the Balfour Declaration was issued, promising a national home for the Jews in Palestine. That triggered all Syrians into action. They sprung into action. I have specific examples of uh, a few people, one from the area of Balbek, one from uh, Marjayoun, one from Hama, uh, and one from Palestine, who were part of this. And also, one of the founders of this early organization is Abdel Hamid Shoman. If you've heard the name before, he's the founder of the Arab Bank, a very successful bank. He was here dabbling into grocery business or whatever. So they got together, they founded what is called the Palestine National League, as part of the Syrian movement, by the way, as a response to the Balfour Declaration. The Palestine National League lasted for a while. They, they were able to send back about $25,000 in aid for beleaguered uh, countrymen. Things were really bad after World War I, by the way, in all parts of Syria. But they were really worried about this partitioning, which became international law. So what happened is that saxe pico agreement, if that sounds familiar, you know, French zone of influence and French direct control in the north, in Syria and Lebanon proper, and part of northern Iraq, and then British direct control and British sphere of influence to the south of that, the 
the idea was to connect the Mediterranean with the uh, Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf, if you will. This way, the Europeans would have a way to reach their wealthy and important um, um, colonies in the Far East. Yeah, so it was well planned. So after World War One, the Balfour Declaration, promising the establishment of a national home for the Jews in Palestine, as long as they don't disturb the existing population. This is, you know, clear example of British chicanery, basically. The Brits are trick, tricksters, basically. They can play with words, they can write something and mean something else. In any case, that was the start of our problems, because it signaled to the Zionists that they can go to Palestine and settle. Yeah. Um, so that was written into international law, along with the, with the sachs fico agreement. So in San Remo agreement, Lebanon became, uh, you know, this, as, as the French hoped it would be, became a country, um, although it did not become completely independent until much later, 1944, 46, depending on who you ask. Same for Syria, Jordan even a little bit, uh, a couple of years later. Um, they call that the mandate system, Wasaya, mandate system. That became international law and the Belfort Declaration. They sat on us basically for the interwar period. During that time, the Syrians revolted in the Shuf Mountains, in all parts of Syria. They, uh, they had an uprising against the French and bumped back uh, with effect, led by Sultan al-Atrash, who is a Druze uh, prince. Yeah? As a result of that, the immigrants here on this side of the ocean started aid efforts to help their countrymen, which culminated in the creation of this is the first organized aid effort since